Okay. Welcome, everyone. Uh, thanks for coming along today. Um, my name is Grant Noble, and my colleague and I, Robert Coot, uh, will be uh, giving you this presentation on the Enterprise Ethereum client uh, specification version 3. So just as an overview of what we're going to cover today, we're going to, first of all, I'd like to give you an overview of the Enterprise Ethereum Alliance, or as we call it, the EEA, and then give you a recap of what has happened before. Because this is version 3 now, we want to give you a recap of what, a little bit about what has happened for version 1 and version 2. I'll be doing that, and then I'll hand over to Robert, who will give you an overview of the things that have just come out for version 3, as well as a bit of a future look into what we're planning for version 4. And then finally, we'll just finish off with some questions. By all means, if you have questions along the way, feel free to um, ask them. And we'll try and make this as, as interactive as possible. So let's, let's talk, let's define a couple of things first of all. First of all, what is, what do we mean by enterprise Ethereum? Well, these are all of the extensions above and beyond public Ethereum that provide things like the private transactions, permissioning, uh, performance improvements, those sorts of things that are important to organizations who want to implement um, Ethereum. So, as we say, the extensions to public Ethereum. A little bit about the uh, Enterprise Ethereum Alliance. Okay, it's a member-led industry organization whose objective is to drive the use of the enterprise uh, Ethereum blockchain technology as an open standard for enterprises. And their mission, and these are direct quotes from their website, is to deliver open standards-based architecture and specification to accelerate the adoption of enterprise Ethereum and to create world-class enterprise Ethereum client specifications and testing and certification programs to ensure interoperability so that different clients from different vendors can interoperate um, so that companies have choice of vendors and to lower costs for its members. Now the number of members tends to fluctuate from month to month but at the moment it's currently sitting at about 300. Um, we have companies like Microsoft and Intel, so some pretty big companies, Hewlett Packard. Um, from the banking industries, for example, we've got companies like JP Morgan Chase in the United States and Banco Santander in Europe. Also, as part of the EEA, we have a number of what we call SIGs, or specialist industry groups, and they work together to uh, create use case documents and so on and so forth, um, specific to their industry. So we have SIGs in the banking uh, area, we have SIGs in finance, legal, um, developing use case documents specific for their own industries. So as I said, this is a presentation on version three. Version one was actually announced in May 2018. Version two in October of 2018, and version 3 was announced just this year in May at Blockchain Week in New York. And so you can perhaps see a bit of a cycle happening here. Um, we've got another announcement for version 4 coming out in October of this year. Uh, this picture that we've got here is really trying to represent, I suppose, how Consensus, the company that I work for, and indeed other organizations, how do we interact with the Enterprise Ethereum Alliance? So for example, both Rob and myself and a couple of other colleagues, we're involved in the standards team within Consensus, within Pegasus. We work directly with the product managers and indeed the development teams, members of the development team, to, um, to develop the, uh, develop the client, uh, in our case, Pantheon. We work directly with the, uh, the working groups within the EEA 
to develop the specification, the client specification, and indeed the other organizations <coughs> that probably have a similar sort of um, working relationship within their own teams. The specification that we develop, the information from that specification, then comes back into consensus and it helps drive how we develop the, the actual client, the client itself. Alright, so let's talk a little bit about, we'll give you a bit of a history, a bit of background of where the, the client specification has come from. Let's look at version 1. Some of the main points, well, first of all, the biggest thing really was it was version 1, alright? We, we, it, it put a stake in the ground for the further development of the specification and gave implementers and client implementers a, um, a way forward to, to create um, compliant client implementations. Uh, also, very importantly, it defined an architecture stack, which was a library of interfaces between the different components of an Ethereum client implementation. We also defined some of the very first extensions to the public Ethereum JSON RPC API. And as well, we defined a number of private transaction types, depending on the privacy requirements for a different organization. So just touching on that architecture stack, it was really important that we created that because it, it effectively gave us an anchor to which all of the different layers of that stack, we could then start to build out and, and generate discussion amongst all of the EEA members to flesh out the details and the requirements of the client specification. All right, so it was really the starting point for development of this version one specification. In version two, we started to make some changes. And changes were uh, in two main areas, I suppose. We changed some of the processes and procedures that we used to develop the specification. And they were, they were for a couple of reasons. We were getting more collaborators involved in the actual development of the specification. So we had to change how we were building that specification. But also to improve the transparency amongst members and also to allow for faster turnaround of updates. We also, of course, wanted to make some additional improvements and additions to the content. So from a process and procedure point of view, um, version one was developed as a Word document in OneDrive. So it was recognized very clearly that as the number of contributors expanded, it was going to be very, very difficult to continue working like that. So we moved it to a GitHub-based uh, repository where members could then contribute to the specification using um, by submitting issues and pull requests and making changes to the specification. We changed the document type. Like I said, we started off as a Microsoft Word document. We moved it into a markdown format that was more suitable. GitHub. We also used a tool uh, that we borrowed from the W3C called Respec, which allowed us to, uh, first of all, render that markdown document into a really nice looking HTML. It also provided things like auto number um, headings, um, allowed us easily to link between terms within the document, as well as it provided us a really nice table of contents that was auto-generated for us. In addition, all of the requirements within the specification, we then uh, we provided identifiers. So able to easily find and reference particular uh, requirements. And we also categorized those different requirements depending on whether they were a protocol requirement or perhaps it was a client requirement or perhaps an external. We added a security considerations, okay. security being obviously very, very important. We added a, uh, or we, we made some changes to the permissions and credentials section. Specifically, we got a little bit more definitive with some of the terms and definitions that we were using 
in the specification. So things like, what do we mean by it? an Ethereum account? What do we mean by a participant? We also made some changes to the JSON RPC API updates. Um, specifically, we added an EEA prefix so that we could namespace some of the EEA specific um, JSON RPC calls. We revised some specific calls. We added some new methods. Okay, and additionally, we specified the methods from core public Ethereum that a client needed to implement to maintain compatibility with that core public Ethereum. We added a new experimental section for network permissioning that specifically used smart contracts. We added uh, this concept of whitelisting and blacklisting of Ethereum accounts. And we added some finer grain permissioning for transaction types, such that um, perhaps an account could only deploy a smart contract or only deploy, or only, sorry, call functions to change the state of a smart contract or to perform a value transfer or any combination of those three. We removed some requirements from the performance section because they were deemed to be um, difficult to measure. So at, at this stage in the evolution of the, of the specification, it was, um, we're putting something into the specification that we couldn't measure, so let's take it out for now. We also removed some requirements for the um, IBFT consensus algorithm because, again, there is more discussion happening in that area. So rather than put in some future stuff, let's put in stuff that is current right now. We revised some of the cross-client compatibility. And finally, we added some requirements to support the Whisper protocol. So that's a very, very quick summary of version one and versions two, where we've come from. I'm now going to hand over to Rob, who will give you um, a snapshot of where we're at now with version three, and then moving forward into version four. Yes. <laughs> Thanks, Greg. Hi, everyone. Um, could I just get a show of hands, first of all? Who's actually uh, had time to read the uh, client specification version three already? Some people. Okay. Maybe almost half. Have you ever had trouble sleeping? <laughs> so yeah, I'm here today to talk about the client specification version three and beyond, as Grant mentioned. The um, just an overview, first of all, of the main focus areas uh, we had in version three. Uh, further improvements to the enterprise permissioning capabilities for node and account or transaction uh, permissioning. Uh, further updates to the JSON RPC API extensions above public Ethereum. There was another focus area. Uh, there was discussion uh, and an agreed common consensus algorithm uh, for inclusion. There are updates to the uh, requirement clarity in many, many places throughout the document and significant improvements to the overall content as, long as, as well as terminology updates and content reorganization to improve the flow and readability. So the biggest uh, update in version 3, however, was by far the uh, enterprise permissioning uh, section. I would like to acknowledge um, Chris Mackay and other Pantheon members in the audience. Um, they contributed greatly to the, te the technical specification working group, uh, and many of those um, contributions were ultimately discussed and accepted into the specification. So thank you for those contributions. So, so this um, permissioning improvement in version three introduced a, a new permissioning model with an architecture that separates the enforcement and the management uh, and the management permissioning rules. This um, uh, this provides both uh, node connectivity and account-based transaction uh, permissioning. It's uh, implemented on-chain uh, with smart contracts, and the advantage of that is that uh, the permissioning rules are then automatically decentralized across the nodes in the, the blockchain. Uh, interfaces are defined and, and provided in the specification for both the node and account uh, permissioning. So the advantages here is that the, uh, the enterprise Ethereum clients only need knowledge of the enforcement interface uh, to call when a permission event occurs, such as a node connection request, 
they don't need to implement internally in the client any of the permissioning rules. So the clients are simplified and obviously there's a maintainability aspect which is much simplified as well. The second advantage of this uh, approach is that the network operators have complete flexibility to implement the permissioning model they wish. They could choose a simple model with uh, no whitelisting um, on the network, or they could go for more elaborate models, uh, such as role-based access control, all implemented in smart contracts, which the blockchain operators would deploy on-chain, not built into the clients. The commissioning model is realized by implementing uh, two smart contract interface functions. Firstly, connection allowed to determine whether uh, to permit a connection uh, with another node. And secondly, transaction allowed uh, to determine whether to accept a transaction from a given account. Uh, both of these uh, interfaces also emit permissions updated events. Uh, when the rules change, this is beneficial to the clients because it allows them to vacation permission information it gives them uh, uh, an opportunity to then uh, refresh that page with the latest uh, information and permissions are updated. There's also a flag which is involved to indicate whether permissions have become more restrictive and if that's the case they can take further action to potentially scan their existing connections and drop any connections which are no longer uh, permitted. So these um, uh, smart contract functions integrate with the, uh, the actual company permissioning management smart contract functions as I mentioned, deployed by the blockchain operator, um, and that allows that allows some um, for configuration and updates <coughs> of the permission rules on the blockchain, typically done by a DAP. Uh, the version three document includes two example uh, permission models with the accompanying uh, management smart contracts. The first one is a simple authorization whitelist, uh, which is to, shows how to maintain uh, a whitelist of uh, e nodes allowed to connect to the, the network. Uh, along with a list of administrative accounts which um, are permitted to alter that whitelist. The second example is an updated version of the smart contracts which were in the version 2 specification. Uh, this was the, um, uh, the example contributed by one of the vendors where we had authorized users from, from organizations being part of member groups, member groups representing an organization, and through a, a voting process, member groups would be uh, voted into the, the network, which is the blockchain. Um, therefore, the nodes in that, uh, in that um, organization will be allowed to connect to the network. Now, they're just examples. They're not mandated. Um, so blockchain operators can use those examples to, uh, to actually base their uh, <coughs> models they wish to use off. So uh, I'm not going to go into any further detail about permissioning right now. There was a very informative presentation a couple of weeks ago uh, called Enterprise Ethereum permissioning that was presented by Sally McFarlane with content uh, provided by Chris McKay. Uh, that goes into the permissioning in more detail uh, as implemented in Pantheon. So uh, you can refer to that um, at that link uh, if you wish to look into that again. Talking about some additional content changes in version 3, we had further JSON RPC API extension updates. There was the EA send raw transaction call added and the send raw transaction async added. Uh, this allows the uh, unalready signed transaction to be passed as input parameter to the client. Uh, and of course, all the accompanying requirements throughout the document which refer to the send transaction calls were updated for these new methods. There was a fair, fair degree of discussion about consensus in the version 3 timeframe. Uh, ultimately, the members agreed to specify the click POA as the common consensus algorithm for the version 3 specification. Um, and in consensus obviously is a is one of the touch points for interoperability between the clients. So that's a key uh, key um, uh, step forward for enabling uh, interoperability between clients, which is one of the ongoing objectives of the EA. The um, the EA technical specification working group has set up a task force within the TSWG, uh, which is currently in progress. And the objective of that task force is to involve members uh, in discussions to come up with an agreement on a common Byzantine fault tolerant algorithm for inclusion in future versions. Now there's been over 50 changes in version 3 of the specification. Uh, I'm not going to go through every one of those. Um, I'm less to say <laughs> that uh, less to say that the commissioning was the commissioning section updates for enterprise commissioning were by far the biggest. 
but here's a few snippets of the other sort of changes which were which were included in the document. And, and feel free to read through those 50 changes in the change summary. Uh, firstly, uh, three levels of uh, nesting were introduced uh, into the organisation, such that sub-organisations were supported within a, an organisation. Uh, there was a requirement uh, mandating support for the Dev P2P node discovery and Dev P2P wire protocols added. Um, we removed unneeded scalability, storage, and consensus requirements um, so that the specification doesn't just grow monolithically, it's reviewed for uh, ongoing applicability and material which doesn't seem to make sense anymore is definitely removed uh, over time. We updated requirements to require transaction type permissioning, um, as Grant mentioned uh, earlier, uh, finer, grain, uh, finer grain permissioning on the deployment of smart contracts, value transfers, updating the start, state of smart contracts. We've updated the node and account permissioning uh, to require the use of smart contracts. And we have updated requirements to specify JSON RPC error codes. In addition to all that, there's been terminology updates, content reorganization, and many requirement clarifications. Uh, terminology and phrasing uh, has been improved for greater consistency. There was a bit of uh, confusion in previous versions around the use of the terms organization, um, uh, client, uh, node, uh, account, and user. So that's been improved in version three to try and make that clearer. Uh, the terminology section at the bottom of the document uh, was um, uh, has been removed, and that material has been spread throughout the document to improve the flow. The first time the term is used, it is the definition of that term is included in line in the document, with links appropriately back to that term when, when it's reused. Similarly, the architecture stack diagram had a uh, an overview section that's been spread throughout the remaining sections where each of the layers in the stack have been uh, have been described and, and uh, referred to for greater flow and readability. There's been textual clarification of requirements were necessary throughout the document. Uh, we've also um, noticed that there was requirements which were non-core uh, to the implementation of the client, so we've created a draft implementation guide and moved those non-core requirements under to that document. So just briefly talking now, uh, plans for version 4 of the specification, which is currently in progress. Uh, it's scheduled for a release October 2019 at uh, DEPCON 4. Uh, this will have, um, the intention of this is to have improvements to the privacy requirements and related content, uh, more focus on improving interoperability uh, between clients. Uh, we'll always look at adopting improvements in your ecosystem, new technologies and techniques, uh, and you know, continued consideration in the TSWG of input from the other industry working groups that Grant mentioned earlier. The EDA has multiple industry working groups uh, in progress, for example, legal, financial, um, oil and gas, etc., etc., um, and they, they usually provide use cases for consideration as requirements in the TSWG core, core client specification. So to discuss all this uh, and um, further contributions and, and the way forward, a face-to-face -face meeting is happening uh, in August, uh, actually 29th to 30th of August in Seattle, and all the members will um, be attending to um, have those discussions. And a few people here will, will be attending, I believe. So for more information about what we've talked about today, uh, you can, if you wish, you can refer to the Enterprise Ethereum Alliance uh, website. Uh, the version four of the specification, the edits draft, is updated constantly whenever there's a change made, so you can see that uh, that that uh, URL right there, and uh, there's also a whole lot of other resources available on the Enterprise Ethereum uh, website and the resources section, such as previous release versions of the specification and other related documents. So that concludes uh, our presentation. Uh, if there's any questions, uh, please let us know. Any questions? Crickets. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's the most exciting reading since the elevator. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, yeah. And, and as a former oh, editor, editor of the, as a former editor of the document, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So I guess the, the thing for me that I'm most curious about is um, for enterprises, how would really prime time is this, and like uh, when could it be used in anger? Are parts of used today? Um, that, that's what I'm most curious about as, as this develops. So uh, the question I didn't hear it quite 
correctly? Yeah. Uh, it, is is um, the stuff used in anger now and uh, yeah. how widely and sure? So uh, the TSWG has numerous members. Uh, so um, uh, the uh, TSWG has um, the technical specification working group. Uh, last time I looked, had about 296 members, and a lot of them are the core vendors, including the clients. Uh, they are taking a very uh, you know, serious look at the uh, and serious involvement in the development of this, this enterprise client specification. So we work uh, as, as Pegasus, being one of those client vendors. You know, we have, um, uh, I guess, some um, our contributions and their contributions discussed widely, and uh, each vendor will provide their input on those uh, on those proposals. And, and, and uh, you know, it's it's treated quite seriously by all the vendors which are being involved towards complying with that specification. Mm. May I expand on that? Yes, you may. So. Pantheon and Pegasus and Quorums and JP Morgan and a couple of other client implementers comply with the spec today, but there is not yet a um, formal compliance program at the EDA, nor is there a test net to demonstrate interoperability. But both of those things are in progress. So as the spec matures, there will be a formal uh, process by which a uh, implementer will need to go through to get their little stamp of approval to say we comply with the EEA spec and we have de demonstrated interoperability with other client implementers. That's coming, um, but uh, it's not complete. Yeah, and I would see that um, as we progress into version four and in, into version five and six and so forth, as you said, David, those things will will be mature, and that the vendors, um, ourselves and, and other um, JP Morgan, will be able to participate in those certification programs, to, as you say, to get that that seal of approval. Any further questions? Yes. What's the commitment being like uh, among the varying members of the EA in assisting in building this? And where have you seen there being a high level of commitment than others? Uh, Look, um, I'd say the commitment's been uh, people have busy schedules in their, uh, their in organizations. Yeah. Um, I think that um, I'd say the commitment's been, been, been reasonable. I'd invite anyone else who's involved to, to make their, uh, their own comments. But, um, um, we'd always like for you on the spot as well. Yeah, yeah, that's okay. <laughs> um, you know, we we always like to encourage higher levels of commitment uh, and um, engagement. But um, you know, we've 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 worked together, uh, I think, fairly well. There was a good turnout at the last face-to-face -face meeting uh, in Lisbon uh, in uh, February this year, uh, and there was very healthy discussion between sort of the four core uh, vendors. So that was really great to see. Um, of course, they go back to their their, their day job, and it's you know they put that. Um, that level of commitment sometimes uh, gets a bit um, uh, a bit reduced because of the day-to-day the -day -to -day job distractions. But generally, my feeling is that um, there's there is a good commitment to support the uh, um, this work, and um, you know we see Pantheon certainly uh, we have active people working on uh, contributing to the contributing to the, the, the TSWG such that there is a uh, continued improvements to the specification. Not to take half of your question. Oh, no, it was just uh, the <coughs> among the members that we've seen there have been interest groups on the the coming from legal. There have been more use cases that have been presented to you in uh, assisting guiding the development. Yeah, probably. Financial. Funny you mentioned legal. That's probably been one of the uh, the more active um, ones. Uh, yeah, so I'd say apart from that, there are similar levels of activity. Yeah. Yeah. I can't get the. It echoes what we see in terms of blockchain uptake in enterprises generally, right? So the early drivers for the first version of the specification were primarily banks because they were the first enterprises to take up the technology. And then you saw insurance companies, certain governments, and, you know, as it fans out through more accounting organizations and, you know, ports and transport and, you know, new vertical industries, then you get more of that kind of stuff. Yeah. You know, those kind of vertical industry uh, foci hitting the spec. Yeah. Right? Legal is legal. Right? Yeah. Yeah. 
I'm interested, so would you say, so you have the old traditional uh, conservative industry versus the more innovative industry, would you say that there's still been that balance in terms of assisting in this development? So, you know, finance has always been cutting edge technology, same with insurance, legal, tails off, more or less. To, um, I can't give any examples of low tech industries, everybody's kind of picked up on the trend now, but would you say that there's been more or less the same curve? I'd say that um, finance, finance organisations have been heavily, uh, heavily um, involved, uh, yeah. the Bank of Santander, etc. Um, other, Jake Baldwin, for example, that's you know, heavily involved. Um, any other comments? Uh, David, do you have um, Legal is a particularly interesting one. I don't know if there are going to be a lot of court cases, but there are going to be people questioning the legality of things that are done in blockchains. Mm -hmm. And I kind of expect that part of the industry to mature in the way we saw the legalities around open source software mm -hmm. mature. There are a lot of open source licenses. Very few of them have been tested in court. The ones that have been tested in court have held up. Okay. I just answer your question further. Um, it's easier for enterprises to contribute in areas they're, they're currently focused on working because they have um, you know, concurrent um, activity in that area and they, they can then uh, sync some of that information to the, the, the standards working group. So that's kind of how it, it um, you know, works nicely and organically within the TSWG. Any other questions today? No? Curious, um, you know, to the healthy, robust discussion. Have there been any interesting points of contention between vendors or contributing parties that you could talk about? Well, yes. <laughs> um, there's been a couple. Uh, only two come to mind. But um, you know, VDA has uh, uh, continually refining their process and the process is in place to um, allow healthy discussion and to allow uh, different views to be put forward in a constructive and, and a manner which um, you know, allows the group to move forward. So um, yeah, there has been a couple of cases, and I'm pleased to say that the the, the process that um, has been built up in the EA is now working well. And uh, despite that, um, you know that um, that those two one of the recent cases, I mean, everyone's still talking to each other and we're moving forward. So uh, yeah. But, but you know, anywhere in the software <laughs> in the software industry, you can't spell API without an F and a U. And yeah, so. Types of spaces. Um, <laughs> the, the standards bodies are trying to develop some kind of specification that includes JSON interfaces and getting competing vendors to agree on them. That's, that's inherently challenging. Mm -hmm. So of course there's a lot of back and forth and discussion in politics, but standards are the sweet spot where you can get people to agree on commonality for interoperability purposes. And that's mm -hmm. Right. But, but there's always tension there. And, and your comment, David, I, I particularly like standards is about getting people to agree such that everyone is equally miserable with the result. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Any last comments? We'll wrap it up. Thank you. All right. Thank you for attending, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.